Responsibility not taken is freedom lost. Turn to um, the epistle to Titus, uh, chapter 1. And Paul is writing to this young man. He says to Titus, verse 4, To Titus, mine own son after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior, for this cause left I thee in Crete. In other words, for the cause of Jesus Christ left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, or the things that are needed, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now the Christian identity movement at such has literally a handful of ministers, numbering perhaps less than four or three or four score total, and even of those, only a small number of them have, have any large ministry or a viable ministry church and so on, and then, of course, there are many men who are taking hold and doing things who are not what we call ordained ministers, but would, in effect, be elders. Now, several years ago, uh, I preached a sermon on this uh, verse and laid out a program where I felt at that time we should appoint or recognize elders all around the United States with the prayer and the hope that this would begin a movement of laymen taking hold and doing things and working for the church and so on. So we did that, however, not an awful lot developed out of it, partially because we, I think, made the mistake of implying that, all right, you men, you're elders now, and we will help you do such and so. Perhaps what should have been done and may have to be done now <coughs> is that laymen are going to have to take hold and do things, begin work, begin a ministry, begin a witness, and then as they begin to accomplish various things. All we will do, or the rest of us in Christendom, ministers and other elders, will simply recognize that they are active elders and they are doing such and so that they should do. So I'm going to um, preach from the Scripture some of the admonition to Christian lay people, what we would call people who are not church-ordained elders as to their responsibility and so on. And then we're going to read some history as to what happened in the past. Now, as most of you realize, I spent almost a month in the hospital recently and about two months recovering, and during the first at least two weeks of that time in the hospital, I did not know whether I would be alive the next day. This was my physical condition was such that the medical doctors in the hospital and a personal friend of mine who was a doctor who checked some of the things that were done with me um, just literally told me and didn't make any bones about it that I was anywhere from five minutes to hours from death at any one time. So, during that time, I had a lot of things to think about. I have written some of this in a newsletter. I have another newsletter going out with some more things, part of which I will read in this morning's sermon. And uh, other than the fact that God answered some prayer regarding my own ministry, the thing that came on me while I was in the hospital was Pastor Emery the ministers are not going to be able to do all the necessary things that must be done in Israel because there just aren't enough of us. If there were a thousand identity ministers, <coughs> Pastor Emery and some of these other men who work so hard could relax a little and not perhaps be so concerned and worried that such and so isn't going to get done unless I do it. And uh, we've prayed about that and we've talked about it, and it seems as if God is not giving us very many additional active ministers who are working full-time in the Israel Identity Movement. So perhaps we have been thinking and praying about the wrong thing. Perhaps God wants more activity from every individual Christian to do all of this work in witness rather than from the so-called ordained ministers like myself and some of the other men. So we're going to read some of this, and I propose to show you that laymen, men not considered necessarily apostles or disciples or preachers, have a great responsibility, and when they don't take that responsibility, they and all of us lose freedom. And I'm going to show you how that has happened, and I'll also show you from history that laymen had a very great part to play in the original spread of Christianity. Now, we think in terms of, well, it was the disciples and the apostles and so on, and we sometimes pass over the passages in the New Testament where other men did what God had told them they should do, and uh, Christianity, or the Christian doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, was spread not just by ordained ministers. 
turn back a page or so in your New Testament to a letter from Paul to Timothy, who was a minister. Paul was a, an evangelist or an apostle, and Timothy became a minister and actually pastored a church at a later date. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among other witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Timothy, you don't preach just so they'll know. You preach so they'll be able to preach and teach to others. And this is true of everything that Pastor Emery and the rest of the ministers do. God help us if all that is accomplished is that I preach and teach what I learn from reading the Scripture, and then you know it, or whoever hears me knows it. And then they never do anything about it for anyone else and don't pass it on. Well, can you imagine how many millenniums it would take <laughs> the handful of God's preachers to carry this gospel compared to what could be done and should be done if we preach others who then teach others. And it doesn't say, commit this to ordained preachers who shall be able to ordain other preachers. It doesn't say that. It just talks of men. We have about 150 million Israelites in this nation alone. And, of course, there are more in Canada and Western Europe and so on. And they all have to or should or will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ sometime in the not-too-distant future, sometime in the next few months or years. And uh, this is one of the things that I say was really came, it became a burden on me while I was in the hospital, is that there is no way that Pastor Emery and the other handful of identity ministers can reach all of these people. And in fact, it may be true that God doesn't want us to do that. Because, you know, if we did develop great, large ministries like some of the so-called fundamentalists, then we'd have glory going to certain individual men in this movement. And I don't think God wants that. God is not going to glorify any man in this movement. Turn back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions or schisms, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And then he explains why they had the divisions. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You are carnal because you are repeating your witness or claiming all of your authority as to coming from some other man. When you should take what you learn from that man, verify it from the Scriptures, and then repeat it as coming from God after you verify it, right? Search the Scriptures to see if these things be so. When Pastor Emery or someone teaches a certain doctrine, you don't go out and say, well, Pastor Emery says. What you do is verify it from the Scripture and then you teach it to others by preaching it, God says, or the Bible says, or the Word says. You cut off this authority as coming from Pastor Emery. If it doesn't have the authority and has been proven in your own mind that it's from God or from the Word of God, don't repeat it. Don't teach it to others if the only authority you have is Pastor Emery. And I think that's why he says they're carnal, because they're saying, well, I'm, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. They're just carnal, mortal men like you are. Now, they taught you some things that made you believe some things, but after all, it's not their doctrine. It's not Paul's doctrine. It's not Apollos' doctrine. It's not Emory's doctrine. It's either God's doctrine or it is false. And um, I don't think all of these men or all of the men today are infallible. One of the things that we um, believe is wrong with the Catholic Church is because they claim their pope or their leader is infallible, can make no mistakes. And that's not true of us, not true of any mortal man. And these people were making the mistake of thinking that whatever they heard from Paul or Apollos, that was it. And they passed it on as Paul's doctrine and Apollos' doctrine. And Paul said, that is wrong. He says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
The glory is to go and must go and should go to God. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. How about that? You are not going to receive a reward for what the preacher does. If you're going to receive a reward for your work, and remember, I'm not talking about salvation or eternal life. I'm talking about rewards from uh, Jesus himself. You're going to receive it for your own work, which includes your own faith, your own witness, and so on. So he is pointing out to them that they'd better be careful about claiming some man as their source of doctrine, because for one thing, that man w will, will gain no reward for them. They do that by their own labor. So he implies that they are laborers, that they are to do something, not just the preacher. Verse 9, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. So Paul treats these Christian people he's talking to as equals with himself in the work. We are laborers together. We should not have a situation where the minister is the only source of all knowledge and the only one who distributes that knowledge and that you sit there as sponges and soak it up but never get it wrung out of you and passed on to third parties. You can see how I, and I'm sure some of the other identity ministers, get very discouraged in the ministry because we can see how little we are doing compared to the whole of Israel. You've got a handful of preachers teaching our people the truth that we are Israel and this is the Zion of Bible prophecy and that certain things are going to come to pass according to God's oath to Abraham. And then out there are 300,000 300, other ministers who do not teach that and perhaps a third to a half of them at least on some occasions, will actively, deliberately preach against our doctrine. So, you know, we, we feel like we're uh, swimming uphill or carrying a rock up to the top of the hill, rolling it back down again and carrying it back up again. We keep doing a lot of work, but we recognize how little we can accomplish. And I think perhaps Paul was thinking of this as he began to point out to these Christians at Corinth you quit bragging that you're following this minister and that one and so on. And you remember, you will get a reward according to your own work. And that work, of course, is faith, belief, witness, and also teaching, as we'll see as we go on here. Ye are God's husbandry. We are laborers together. Verse 10, According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. It's all right to say, well, the preacher has built a foundation, but it needs more hands than the preachers to, to complete the edifice. Because we're talking about a great and mighty people in a great and mighty nation. This is no small thing. We're not working in a few square miles of territory. We are working in the largest land on earth, the one that God is going to do most of his work in in the end of this age. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see, you don't lay your foundation on Paul. You don't lay your foundation on Apollos. You don't lay your foundation on Pastor Emery. Pastor Emery may have laid some of the foundation, but the foundation is Christ. And you be sure you build on Christ, not on any man. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Here's the repetition, the double witness in the same passage, that there is a reward for that man's work. And we know from the parable of the talents and others uh, where the man was rewarded for uh, being a diligent and faithful servant, a working servant, by the way, that he was given rule over ten cities, another man over five, the one that produced nothing at all, 
everything was taken from him. So there is apparently going to be a reward in the kingdom for what you do here. You're not going to get to the kingdom by work. That's the free gift of God through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. He's going to lose something if it's hay and stubble rather than being built out of brick and stone. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So he is not going to be lost himself, but he will lose something if he does not build well, work, be a co-laborer, witness, and do those things that he's supposed to do for the Lord Jesus Christ in this age. Now, I'm going to read some things from my uh, uh, newsletter, and then, God willing, the rest of you will read all of it and take it to heart, and then I'm going to be praying not about Pastor Emery, but about all of these thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have been given knowledge and understanding of the gospel of the kingdom and who do little or nothing about it. And uh, if the shoe fits, put it on, as they say, you know. Anyway, I, I'll have uh, perhaps um, ten times as much in the newsletter as what I'm going to read here. After I give some idea of some of the things they should do, then I said this in the newsletter. As more and more identity Christians without regular churches begin to do what you should have been doing all along, conducting worship services in your own home, cooperating with other local Christians and arranging local Bible conferences to which your neighbors would be invited, local identity ministries will develop and Pastor Emery's ministry and that of others will be needed less and less. I don't mean to say America's promised ministry will be reduced and fade away. It may not be reduced at all during the increasing growth of the whole movement, but I would certainly welcome such reduction if it would help establish churches in scores, then hundreds, then thousands of homes across America. The identity movement has not had many ministers, and certainly no large ministries, and they may not really be needed. After all, what God Almighty wants from His people is obedience, and that means obedience from all of you, not just from the ministers. We ministers have been trying to do it all. We should realize we cannot. And then, of course, there's more in that same vein. And then a little later in the newsletter, I said this. Almost the entire New Testament is directed to the individual Christians rather than to ministers as such. Read the epistles. In addition, there are many admonitions to the elders, meaning the older men in the Christian group or community, that they were to take command, to teach, to admonish the younger, to take responsibility for the flock. The idea that all active teaching, preaching, charity, arranging for meetings, evangelical outreach, and so on, is to be the sole responsibility of ministers is not in the New Testament. For Israel to really get back to primitive or correct Christianity, individual Christian Israelites must get away from dependence on church-ordained ministers and begin to do more of the work of the body of Christ themselves. Now, I said at the beginning of this, or I gave in the t title, the indication that if you refuse your responsibility, you will lose your freedom. Now, we know why, scripturally, we are losing our liberty and our freedom. It's because we are in disobedience to God's word, is it not? Now, we have made a lot of emphasis on disobedience to the law. Perhaps we've not carried the explanation of that disobedience far enough to point out that it isn't just a case of disobeying individual specific laws, but it's also a case of disobeying these specific commands and exhortations that we, as Christian believers, are to do certain things in relation to our family, our community, and our nation. Take responsibility, witness, preach, teach, and so on. And sometimes we're so careful that we don't eat pork and we don't steal anything from anyone that perhaps we forget to do the positive things. We try to stay away from the negative things and we fail to do the positive. So you know why on one specific reason we are losing our liberty and our freedom because we are disobeying the Almighty. All right, let me list some areas in which 
our not taking responsibility and obeying God in those areas has lost our freedom in those areas. I've got them listed here. They're not necessarily in order of, uh, of importance. In fact, this isn't necessarily all of the areas. I may have forgotten some things. The first one is education. Originally, in America, most children were taught in their own home. Later, as they grew up, perhaps a hired tutor. Once in a while, they would organize a small number of families, and that, and that group of families would hire a teacher, and then the parents would oversee it. As recently as my own elementary education, I went to school in a one-room schoolhouse in Wisconsin with about 25 to perhaps a maximum of 35 children in the school. We had three school board members elected by that group of parents. They hired the teacher, and I can remember my father was on the school board for perhaps 20 years, and the school board members read every book that went into that school. The school board members read every book before they purchased a book as a textbook or a library book. Someone was assigned to read that. And they were parents and their children were in the school. Now that's very close supervision. We have allowed some other people to come along and say, well now, that's a lot of trouble doing all that. We can do it better for you. You give us the responsibility We'll educate your children. You turn them over to us. And we did. And what are we losing? We are losing our liberty and our freedoms and we're almost on the point of losing our children because we didn't take the responsibility for educating our children in our own home, raising them up in the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ by teaching them out of the Word as they were raised up. Second area is crime. We used to have one elected sheriff and then he would call upon the men in the community whenever he needed them. Then someone came along and says, well, what we need to do is hire uniformed police officers and set up a police bureau, and they'll take care of crime. What has happened? Well, over the intervening years, not only have they not taken care of crime, we now find that police bureaucracy out harassing us. We find it so far to the extent that recently I was told at a meeting up in uh, on the north side of Phoenix, or beyond the Phoenix city limits, the sheriff was there because they were having so much crime in the neighborhood and they wanted some police protection. And the sheriff told the individuals, well, the DPS, or the Department of Public Safety's main purpose is not in protecting you from crime, it is in raising revenue. In other words, the police department's main job is to stop you from driving 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone, or to give you a parking ticket when you park too long someplace, or arrest you for not having a valid driver's license or a license on your car to raise money for the bureaucrats. You gave up your responsibility for joining in to punish criminals. You've turned it over to someone else, and it's being turned against you, and you're losing your liberty and your freedom. How about charity and welfare? 200 years ago, that was taken care of by individuals and by the church. People in government came along and said, we'll... Well, we have to organize this because there are some people who are not being helped. Now, if you'll turn it over to us, we'll take all this responsibility. You don't have to worry about seeing that your neighbor has enough to eat and enough to live on in a good house. We'll take care of that. And so you gave up your responsibility. When I say you, I'm talking about your parents and grandparents and mine, right? This began generations ago. And they did not do the charity they were supposed to do as commanded by the Word of God. They turned it over to someone else. And now they are being robbed and their money is being taken from them to give, give some of it to the poor and the rest of it to a what? A class of bureaucrats who are actually drones on society who live off from the workers. What about medicine? In the United States, in early America, medicine was taken care of by home remedies. They still use the term home remedies or by someone in the community who had educated himself on herbs and the use of other things and midwives for delivery? Well, they came along and they said, well, what we have to do is organize medicine and license it. We want to be sure that we have good doctors, and now it's reached a point where anyone who attempts to take care of themselves and perhaps even give advice, good advice, to someone else regarding a health problem, and what happens? The authorities are going to come along and arrest them and say, no, you can't do it. You gave up that responsibility for your own health, a hundred years ago, and we'll put anyone in jail who tries to practice without our permission. 
How about the law? According to the scripture, as you know, that disputes between Christians are to be settled between themselves, and if they can't settle it, then they go to the church, and it's to be settled in the church. It's not to be settled in the courts. Well, we have allowed an entire law system to be established in this country where we say, no, we don't settle our own disputes. We go hire these licensed attorneys from the bureaucrats. I saw a letter to the editor in a patriotic paper just recently, and the man pointed out that the United States of America has 6% of the world's population, and we are being forced to support 65% of the world's lawyers. No wonder it costs us so much for law. And law, under God's word and God's command, would cost us nothing. We would appoint the judges. They would be paid out of our 10% tithe. And when we needed help or arbiters for disputes, we go to the Christian judge or the Christian minister or some of the elders, and they get down to the matter and decide it on a Christian basis, no charge. And instead we pay so much money, and now on top of that we're finding out that the attorneys have been elected into the legislatures and into be governors and mayors, and they are writing laws. And they are enforcing the laws. What happened? We gave up our responsibility under God to settle disputes through the Christian believers and the church, and now we have a bureaucracy that is taking away our freedom and our liberty under the guise of doing something we should have been doing for ourselves. I listed food in here or farming because to some extent that is also being taken away from us by a bureaucracy. Instead of the farmers or the individual raising their own food or finding out how to raise it, they have turned that over to a bureaucracy in the so-called universities and the departments of agriculture, and they come back and they say, well, you do this and you do this, and you put this fertilizer on and you put this pesticide on, and they go ahead and do it. What did we do? We gave up our responsibility. We disobeyed God's laws, agricultural laws, and what comes about? An alien and foreign bureaucracy that sets up and does all of that, and our food is getting worse, and our medicine is getting worse, and we're losing our health, our liberty, and our freedom. And then finally, in case you hadn't come to that one uh, yet, I have listed as number seven here, religion. What I've been reading from just a few things in the New Testament you can see that the preaching of the true religion was the responsibility of all Christians. Every individual Christian had a responsibility to witness, to teach, to learn, to verify the things from the Scripture, and not depend on Paul and Apollos and these handful of apostles and disciples. They could help lay a foundation, help do some initial work, but the work was to be done by all of the Israelites, all of the believers. And uh, back in early America, and as we read the New Testament especially, you'll find out the only mention of a, ch of a church that we might think of as a group of people was the church in somebody's home. All the Christian churches were in someone's home in the New Testament. And uh, we know from history that that was true. And later on, of course, those people uh, over the centuries gave up their individual responsibility as the father and the mother of their household, of teaching God's Word to their children, they turned it over to an organized bureaucracy and eventually developed into what we know as the medieval church. Finally, in some countries in Europe, you could not profess to even teach the Bible unless you had the approval of the church or a license from the state. And in the United States of America in the early days, the churches were very small. They were often in individual homes. When they did organize a community church, they built a small building, and all the families in the immediate area attended that church. They had elders and ministers, and everyone took responsibility, and the parents had Bible studies in their own home and among their own people. They didn't depend on the minister for all of the interpretation of the Scripture. But as a people, we have disobeyed God. We've turned away from our responsibility to teach and preach this word to our own families and our own community, not through ordained ministers, but through every professing Christian, we have turned it over to a bureaucracy called the organized church because they said, well, let us do it, and you just go about your business all week, and you come in here once a week for an hour, and I'll tell you what God says. 
And now we've reached a point where the average Israelite in America is almost totally as ignorant of the Bible as he is of food and medicine and law and charity and crime and education, right? He has given up his responsibility to third parties. The third parties have done it, and we're ending up with a dictatorship in every field. Now, in the religious field, you're just beginning to feel the hand of this bureaucracy to some extent and some of the things that have happened recently in um, the controversy in Louisville, Nebraska. You may or may not have seen the newspaper article, but I, talk, I read it in our local paper and I talked to one of the men from the church up there. Pastor Sullivan, who had organized and set up a church school, children from six parents in the school, they did not get the approval of the state of Nebraska and they refused the approval. They said, no, the parents are responsible here. They're the ones that hire the teacher and they're doing it and they're seeing that the children are going to be taught God's word. Well, after about a year and a half, this has been going on with the controversy and arrests and keeping in jail and so on, they finally have arrested and convicted Pastor Sullivan. I do not know exactly what the charge was, but I know what the sentence was. And he was sentenced to prison for whatever the charge was, and the judge, in setting up the sentence, gave Pastor Sullivan instruction that he is to tell the families of the children that they are to take their children out of his school and uh, register them in a state-approved school. Then those children are to stay in that state-approved school, and if they don't stay there, Pastor Sullivan will stay in jail. Now, if you haven't recognized that, that is not a biblical sentence for a crime, neither is it a constitutional one. It is a Soviet-style sentence where one party is placed in prison or a slave camp in order to get obedience to the state from another party. You follow what I'm saying? The state said to the parents of those children, we have Pastor Sullivan as a hostage. We will hold him as a hostage until you obey our commands. The Soviet Union, Red China, every communist country in the world controls their people by picking up one party, torturing him, killing him, or putting him in prison to force obedience by other parties. At any one time in the Soviet Union, they have 10% of their people in slave camps, 10% of the population. That forces the other 90% to obey the dictator. This has now come to America. They are putting people in prison to force obedience by parties who are left outside the prison. That's what's happened in Pastor Sullivan's case. The judge read the whole thing, just as if it was a common thing and a common law. Well, what have we done? Now, again, let me repeat. You can blame the judge. You can blame all sorts of other people. But you have to blame God's Israel people, including professing Christians. Because in one area after another, we have gotten away from the Word of God we have not done what God told us to do, and God told us if we didn't obey Him, we would end up under the control of alien people, and that's exactly how the alien people take control. As we shirk our responsibility, they take over the responsibility, and they run it their way. And this is right down today to religion. Not too long ago, I, had, I, I was refused by a radio station to go on a um, station... And um, I called the man on the phone and talked to him, and he told me that they did not accept any radio broadcast except ministers approved by that city's council of churches and the local B'nai B'rith. So you see, we're not that far away from where you have to have the approval of the religious bureaucracy before you can preach. Now, they may be able to control, through this religious bureaucracy, 20 or 30 Christian identity ministers. But can you imagine what they would have to do if they had to control 10,000 Christian identity laymen who were preaching and teaching and working and writing and so on? Let me close for today, and I have some more on this, so let me close for today in reading something in Ephesians, and then I'm going to read the seven things that I mentioned in my newsletter. Ephesians 4. 
beginning in verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, it doesn't say, and you know, sometimes we read into the Scripture a lot more than is there because we take tradition out here and we add it to it. It doesn't say in here that he made some full-time prophets, full-time evangelists, full-time pastors, and full-time teachers. It doesn't say that at all. There's nothing in this verse that says a man can't work at a regular job and then be a pastor, teacher, evangelist, or prophet to his own home or his own community in his spare time. And thank God we have laymen out there now who are beginning to do that. We have one man up in Ohio, Bill Stritmatter, who works full-time at a job and has developed a very excellent Bible law course, which he does in his spare time. Alongside of Bill Stritmatter, we probably have another thousand people in the same area who do nothing. And they really know the gospel of the kingdom, and they know the word, and they understand the law. They probably don't talk to another person a year about the gospel of the kingdom. So you see, we have a tremendous number of people who are shirking their responsibility. And if you don't remember anything that I said today, uh, anything other than this, remember, when they have shirked the responsibility that God has laid on them, that is disobedience to God, and disobedience to God brings dictatorship and alien rule. And you can see it's done it in every segment of our society. Verse... Um, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, and that every part means of every Christian and every believer, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. In other words, the entire body of Christ is to be working in and for the body of Christ. And we have gotten so far from that that we now have, I suppose, hundreds, perhaps thousands of churches in America where they have one or two preachers and they'll have a thousand and two and three and four and five thousand professing Christians come there once a week for an hour to two hours and those professing Christians think they have done all they have to do in their responsibility to God Almighty. They have not done what they're responsible to do in education, in crime, in charity, in medicine, law, in our food, and in our religion, and those things have been taken from us and we have a dictatorship set up over us. We have lost our freedom because lay people have been deceived into thinking ministers would not only teach all the word they needed, but ministers would protect them from losing their liberty and their freedom. And ministers can not do it. It's God's people themselves who have to take the responsibility. Now, God willing, I'm going to have some more to say next week on this, and we'll get back into history a little more to show you that where lay people took their responsibility, it brought about freedom and the spread of the gospel in spite of how few or how many ordained ministers there were. Now, I'm not putting down ordained ministers. They have a work to do. Traveling evangelists have a work to do. They can help lay the foundation. But the edifice has to be built by the house of Israel. Our Father and our God, we do pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will pour out your spirit upon our people. Father, wake us from sleep and show us that the day is far spent and the night is at hand. God, give us of your word and your wisdom. And we pray especially for all the fathers and mothers who will be hearing this, that they will see and understand their responsibility in their own home begin to take it at home, and then they can take it in the community and in the nation. Lord God, we ask this that you might bless us all with your word and with liberty and with freedom, that we might preach and know and understand the gospel, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Responsibility not taken is freedom lost. In part one, we saw that the New Testament plainly speaks to all Christians about the work of witnessing and doing those things that God has ordered Christians to do. 
and specifically among their family and then, of course, their community and eventually the whole house of Israel. We read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, where Paul says to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Notice it does not say the same commit thou to faithful men and lead them to Christ. Now, it is true today that the common theme of organized Christianity or churchianity is that if you know Jesus as your Savior, your work then is to witness to others, to lead them to Christ, to save them so that when they die they won't go to hell or they'll go alive in the rapture rather than have to spend seven years of tribulation and so on. And that all you need to know is to tell them to open up their heart and let Jesus come in and then they'll be saved. Now, that doctrine takes about 60 seconds to present and about 60 seconds to learn, and yet here he says, Commit thou to faithful men these things that you've learned, who shall be able to teach others also. And then in verse 15 he follows it by saying, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in other places in Scripture, we're told to study diligently and read the, God, read the Word of God, read the law every day, and we are instructed to make this a lifetime project of learning God's Word. And yet the common theme of most of Christianity today is you don't really need to know hardly anything at all. Just a very little bit and perhaps just a few verses. And here Paul says to this man, you study to show yourself approved. Chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now what scripture did Timothy know that made him wise unto salvation? that gave him the wisdom to understand what salvation was. Well, it must have been the Old Testament, because when Timothy was growing up, he didn't have these letters of Paul's, didn't have the Gospels or anything. Paul commended him that he had known the Holy Scriptures from his youth on up. Now, today, we have been given to believe by much of the church that, well, if you know John 3.16 and Acts 2.38 and perhaps... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, that's about all there is to the gospel. That you simply have to know that Jesus came, died, shed his blood for your sins, and when the rapture comes, you're going to go in the rapture. And uh, I've talked to individual Christians who have attended churches for years and years, and then they began to read the Bible and suddenly realize that for 20 years they had heard this little teeny bit of the Word of God, and that's all they'd ever heard. A thousand pages in this book, and sermon after sermon was preached on a dozen or fifteen or maybe two or three general doctrines, and part of it was wrong. Paul must have meant that Timothy knew or had access to or had studied from the time he was a child the books of Moses, the Psalms and Proverbs, and the books of the prophets. Scriptures today that these same ministers tell us we don't even need to read, that they're not even written for us. And yet Paul said to Timothy, those scriptures are the ones that made you wise unto salvation. The whole word of God would take you hours, sometimes days to read, and a lifetime to understand. And we are fed a little teeny doctrine that takes about 60 seconds to teach and understand. They begin with Jesus and end up with heaven or the rapture. And yet even in the New Testament, when you have a sermon in there like Peter's or Paul's or Stephen's, they began with the God of creation talking to Abraham, went all the way through Jacob, Israel, then down to Jesus Christ and to the kingdom. The modern doctrine in the church today does not fit to any extent with the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 16 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, is given for these purposes. That is another reason why I am preaching these sermons, because when you realize how large this book is, 
you realize that a handful of preachers cannot teach this to all of Israel. You have to study it yourself. Pastor Emery, as we saw Paul did, can lay some good foundation. And that foundation is Jesus Christ, but you have to build thereon. I cannot build your Christian understanding and your Christian life. You have to do most of the building yourself. I can show you some of the plans, show you some of the tools, and do some of those things, and that's about it. I don't live long enough to teach anyone hardly beyond myself. And that's true of most of us. That's why we all have to get involved. On any Sunday morning in America, somewhere around 110 million Americans are in church. On Easter, it's probably 180 million, but, uh, or Christmas. But on any Sunday morning, about 110 million, about one half of the U.S. population, and they're in 325,000 Protestant churches and about 19,000 Roman Catholic ones. 75 million of them would be over 18 years of age, or what we would consider to be adults. About 20 million would be over 50 years of age. And at least 30 million of these adults would have been attending some church fairly regularly for from 10 up to 50 years. And yet, how few or what percentage of these could be classed as Bible students? You think about the professing Christians that you have met in the last few years or in your lifetime, how many of them really knew very much about the Word of God. And yet many of them have been in churches regularly, or rather regularly, for 10 and 20 and 30 years. And they can quote John 3.16 and Acts 2.38 and 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17. And maybe even half of John 4.22, salvation is of the Jews, or part of Romans 14.14, there is nothing unclean of itself in case you should read God's law about eating pork to them. See. They know a few verses of Scripture to answer you when you come along with sound doctrine. And usually what they answer you with are these things I just read here, which are five or six words out of a verse of Scripture, a portion or a part of it, and they've been taught to misapply it. So I would say that 99%, I'm not talking about the people who don't attend church, 99% of the people who attend church would fail a kindergarten test on the Word of God. Now, I wonder if we today are really more ignorant of the Word of God than the population was in Paul's time. You think about this for a moment. As you read through the New Testament, you realize that um, it recounts how the gospel of Jesus Christ was taken to various cities, and you read the book of Acts, and you find that wherever they went, they found believers, they found good students of the Word, they found churches in homes, and they preached, and in many cases they were accepted by a lot of people. Today we have millions of Bibles that are out in these homes, a hundred million people who go to church regularly. The religious news broadcaster claims that there are 42 million Americans who claim to be, quote, born again. And yet, if you were to compare their knowledge of the Scripture to the knowledge of those people in the pagan Mediterranean area at the time of Paul, they probably were as knowledgeable then as they are today. So we are like the time of the early apostles and disciples. We are going out in and among a populace totally ignorant of the Word of God in spite of the fact that they profess to believe in Jesus Christ. Second Timothy 4, going right on. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Don't teach them a few verses and let it go. You teach and preach and teach and teach with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, teachers who will preach what the people want to hear, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, is that what has happened? I believe that it has. And then he says to Timothy, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof or fulfill thy ministry. He was to preach this word in spite of what the people did. And I think this pertains to all of you, not just ministers. You keep 
doing that which God has told you to do, whether or not the other people turn. Because I know from my own experience, and you, you know from your own experience, that you may meet five or ten or twenty or thirty people who will not respond, and then all of a sudden you meet some person, you preach a word to him, you teach him, you show him, and man, his face lights up and he's just thrilled that you've come and told him this good news. And then he turns and he takes the Bible and he probably reads it more than you do. So they are out there. People hungry for the word of God are among the people of Israel. I read a list in the first sermon of the areas in which we, and I should add our fathers and our grandfathers, have neglected our responsibilities. We've not obeyed God's word and we've lost our freedom in those areas. Education, crime, charity and welfare, medicine, law or controversy, agriculture or food, and also religion. Our fathers and grandfathers did not apply God's holy word and God's holy law in those areas. They lost control of those areas, and the aliens, the atheists, and the antichrists have come in with their men's doctrine, their humanism, and they have taken over those areas, and we are losing our freedom. Why? Because we did not do what God told Israel to do, to read, study, learn, and to put into practice his law. He told Israel we'd go into captivity, and we are in captivity because of these things. So I am attempting to enlist thousands of identity Christians not just to learn the gospel of Jesus Christ and know who we are, not just to learn about the kingdom off in the future, but to learn about Christ's kingdom, Christ's rule now, so we will begin to do what we know we're going to do in the kingdom, obey Jesus Christ, obey his commandments and his word. And that means that individuals have to do a lot more than they've been doing in the past. It's not enough to say, I am a Christian, but we have to eat, sleep, breathe, and work as a Christian. It's not enough to be a Christian from 9 o'clock on Sunday morning till 12.15. And we have millions of people, their own... Their, only work, witness, and testimony is the walking in the door of a church, sitting down, absorbing something. In many cases, they don't know what. And they walk back out, and nothing happens that you could call Christian in their life until 9 o'clock the next Sunday morning. Now, in my newsletter, I listed a number of areas, a number of active works that people can do. I'll just read them briefly here, and then I hope and pray that everyone will read my May newsletter over a couple times, because it's intended to enlist you in a good work that will benefit you and your children. Let's not do what our grandfathers and our fathers did, turn away from the word and left us without the word. Let's not leave our children and our grandchildren without the word. Number one, begin a home Bible study. Number two, a home worship service. And I especially say this because most of the people who have been given by God the understanding of the Israel message and the kingdom message are not near or where they can even drive to an identity church. Most of them are not. There probably isn't 5% of the identity Christians who live where they can attend where an identity minister is. And so most of them, or a lot of them, still go to the Baptist church, the Pentecostal church, the Lutheran church, or whatever. They need to begin home worship service. And then they should share that with other families, invite other people in. And after they do that, they should exchange that. In other words, they have a worship service in their home. Someone else does 50 miles away. They should visit each other, just as if they had a church and a congregation. You know, so there's five people there instead of 500. What's the difference? Two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. God said he's in the midst of them. And then I'm also urging some of them to write and print their own studies and ideas. And that is being done, praise God, by more and more people on our mailing list, laymen who will write out a Bible study, mimeograph it, or have it printed at a quick print shop, and then they'll sit down and address letters to their relatives and their friends and their neighbors and their co-workers, and they'll mail it out. We have received a number of very excellent ones done by laymen, including men in their 20s, where they're putting out uh, four pages, eight pages, 12 pages, sometimes once a month, sometimes two or three times a year. Bible studies, information that Christians should have. And can you imagine what would happen in this Israel nation as God begins to pour out his spirit upon us if 10,000 people were distributing their own personal newsletters to just their own relatives and their own brethren. It would bring about a revolution, a Christian revolution in this nation. 
Also, lay people can arrange public meetings. In the past, most of them have waited for Pastor Emery to call up a hotel or find some place to have a meeting and to get speakers and then set up a meeting in some city here or some city there and so on. Lay people can do that themselves. They can contact the hotels, find out where the meeting places are, set it up, and then invite ministers to come and or other lay people or do some speaking themselves. You folks who have attended our uh, Bible camps for four or five years, if you'll recall, about ten years ago, we would have a three-day conference, and we would have five, perhaps five speakers, all ministers. Now we have a six-day Bible camp in the summer, and we will have 20 to 21 or 22 speakers, and only two or three of them are ministers. The rest are all lay people. So we have proven that lay people can get up before an audience and preach and teach as good and um, sometimes better than the ordained ministers. That's true. Some of these men do a very fine job. And they also can, here's number seven, do weekend conferences. In other words, actually set up three days, not just one night, and invite speakers. And we'll help them, we'll cooperate with them, and so on. Now, our fathers and grandfathers didn't do this. Our fathers and grandfathers decided what they would do was simply go to the local church over there and spend three or four or five hours in that church once or twice a week, and that's all they did. And the result has been what you see. Millions, millions of people who go to church and know practically nothing about the Word of God. They simply do not know it. They're ignoramuses of God's Word. And, of course, because of it, what has come about, exactly what God said would come about, if we didn't study learn and obey, we would lose our freedoms. Now, you can blame the communist, you can blame the antichrist, you can blame the humanist, you can blame all these other people all you want. But we are losing our liberties and our freedoms because of what we did not do, not because of what they did do. And uh, it's about time that you all began to come in and go to work. Turn to Ephesians uh, 5. Beginning in verse 5, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. You see, the children of disobedience that we think are our enemies, and we think they have so much control over us we can't get out from under it, Remember, they're under the wrath of God. God is their adversary. And they have no power over us except as we neglect God's word and obedience to it. They are nothing. The prophets referred to them as chaff before the wind when Israel obeys. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. That's your continuing work. And how do you do that? You have to read and study God's Word to find out what is acceptable unto God. Verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, in spite of the fact that there are a few ministers in the Kingdom Identity Movement who have radio broadcasts, This idea of reproving the works of darkness is beyond us. Because, you see, they don't listen to my radio broadcasts. They turn me on for a few minutes, and then they'll turn me off. So this reproving of the works of darkness almost has to be done by individual Christians all over the nation, by their actions and by their works and by their exposure and exposés of the unfruitful works of darkness. And by the way, you're not going to do a very good job of that if you stay in churches which preach darkness. And a church which preaches a false doctrine, a false gospel, and a false Christ is a church of darkness. And you children of the light should be getting out. Now to Philippians 1, beginning in verse 27. Only let your conversation, or your whole life is what that means, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, 
not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. In other words, they were to suffer for Christ. They were to have the same kind of conflicts as Paul. And along with it, he said in verse 28, Be nothing terrified by your adversaries. It is true that some of our people, not all of them, thank God, but some of them are quite terrified of the Antichrist and those enemies who seem to have so much control over us. But you know, the adversary that keeps most Christians from doing the work and witness they're supposed, supposed to do is not the Antichrist and the atheist and the alien. You know who that adversary is? He's your family and your friend and your neighbors because you're afraid of what he's going to say and think about you. I think more Christian people fail to do the work and witness of Christ because they are afraid of what their acquaintances and relatives will say than they are afraid of what the Antichrist will do. Now, you think about that for a moment. I have people write to me and they say, Pastor Emery, you certainly are a brave minister speaking out. Aren't you afraid that the enemy will kill you? Well, it's always possible that they could. But, you know, even as a minister, I recognize that I probably have more difficulty and have to think about and pray about what I'm doing, and I have more criticism from so-called friends than I have opposition from the enemies. Most of you, you think about yourself for a moment. Why are you not doing some of the things I listed? Why are you not having a Bible study in your own home? Why are you not printing up material and signing your name to it and distributing it to your friends? Is it because you're afraid that some antichrist will get a hold of it and come over to your house and throw a rock through your window? No, it's probably because you're afraid that your co-worker or your neighbor or your cousin or your father or mother will start speaking against you. It's fear of what our friends and our relatives and our acquaintances might think about us that holds us back and keeps us silent about these things. And so we do not do these things which Paul said is given unto us, verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him. Millions of our Anglo-Saxon Israelites believe on him, and that's all they do. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And he's not talking about suffering by somebody coming out and beating you up or shooting you or something like that. He's talking about this thing of friends and neighbors saying, oh, wasn't so-and-so a nice fellow until he got religion. You ever hear that phrase? Well, that's some of the suffering that you'll do. Here's a news article that really brings this home to us to some extent. This is just recent. This was May 2nd. The headline says, Cultists approach half of San Francisco teens poll fines. And you listen to this, because I listed seven things that you are to do. The eighth one, after you begin to do some of those things, is contacting the young people of America. We have been negligent in that, but listen to what the cults do. United Press International, San Francisco. More than half of the teenagers in the San Francisco Bay Area have been approached about joining religious cults, a survey by two psychologists who research cult membership drives showed Tuesday. The survey showed that 54% of the high school students polled said they had been approached by groups such as followers of Sun Myung Moon, the Hare Krishnas, and the Children of God. Two-fifths of the 1,010 teenagers questioned said they had been approached three to five times. One-fourth said they had six or more encounters. In other words, these cults that I just listed here are diligently going out and contacting high school age youth of America. And I have talked to other ministers and I've talked to lay people in the Christian identity movement and you know we hardly contact a handful of high schoolers in a year's time. It went on. But even more surprising is that a large percentage of these kids, even if they haven't been contacted, report being open to finding out about cults and attending cult functions, meaning they are available for more intensive recruiting. In other words, they were surprised to find that a tremendous percentage of high school age young people in America are interested in finding out about religion. So you could probably 
make up a newsletter and put all of your nieces and nephews and all of the cousins of high school age and college age on your mailing list, and you'd probably find that half of them would respond in some positive manner to your message. And yet what happens with most, of Christ, most Christian identity people? Many of them don't even tell their relatives they believe we're Israel or that Jesus Christ is going to rule over the kingdom and the house of Israel. I've talked to individuals who've known this message for 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years and they never told another single solitary person about it. I had a retired United Methodist minister call me about two years ago here to let me know he was up at Prescott, Arizona, and he was conducting a Bible study every week teaching the Anglo-Saxon identity of the house of Israel. I thought, well, isn't this marvelous? This retired United Methodist preacher is preaching the Israel message. So I talked with him a few moments, and I asked him how long he'd known this, because I was going to you know, help him out, teach him a little bit. Oh, I've known this for 40 years, he said. And I stopped for a moment and I said, well, did you teach it in your church? Oh, no, I couldn't teach it in my church. He said, but I retired two years ago, so now I'm teaching it. He knew this for 38 years while he was a minister and never taught it because he had to stay and teach their doctrines. And I think there are scores, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of ministers like that. I know of lay people, I know of one specifically who lives here in the Phoenix area, who has known the Anglo-Saxon Israel message for most of his life. He was raised knowing it. He married a Baptist girl, went to the Baptist church, raised all of his children in the Baptist church, and never even told them they were Israelites, because his wife didn't like the doctrine, and so he wouldn't discuss it. His children grew up not knowing they were Israelites, right in the home with the father knowing it. Now, I've run across other cases very similar to that. And here these cults, Sun Myung Moon, the Hare Krishnas, and the children of God, actively go out and try to put their false doctrines in the minds of the high school and college people of America, and we do little or nothing in that field. We do most of our teaching to ourselves, I'm afraid. But anyway... Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And maybe suffering for his sake means you're going to have to go out and start teaching this to some people who might not want to listen to you. Well, I said I was going to give you some examples of what had happened in the early centuries to prove to you that ministers or apostles or disciples didn't do everything. So I'll have to read a few of these in the time remaining. Turn back to Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve, and remember this is the disciples, called the multitude of the disciples unto them. There were many more disciples, not just the twelve. And said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we appoint whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And then it tells about them picking out separate, separate people. Verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Verse 7, and the word of God increased. They chose lay people to do other parts of the ministry and put them to work. Chapter 8, beginning in verse, beginning in verse 1, and Saul was consenting unto his death. This was Stephen. And at that time there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles, these other lay people. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, that would be the body of believers, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore... They that were scattered abroad were frightened and quit talking about Jesus Christ. doesn't say that. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, I'm trying to get lay people to start doing things to preach the word before the Saul's of our day come into your houses and drive you out and scatter you out where you'll preach the word. Some of you should start it now without waiting for the persecution which will really make you preach the word, and I think it will. Acts 11, verse 19. 
Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenus and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. In other words, they went to the Judeans. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. As near as I can tell from this, this did not include the disciples. These were the others who had learned from the disciples. And here they're going to city after city after city and preaching. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Lay people went to Antioch and preached the word, and many believed. Now the minister comes along afterward. You see, you think the minister has to go first. It's the other way around who when he came and had seen of the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. So the preacher comes along afterward and says you're doing a fine job, but they believed they'd been preached to, they'd been taught before the preacher came. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the name was laid on the house of Israel at Antioch, a city that was converted to Christ by laymen, not by ministers nor by disciples. The ministers came later. Acts 13, chapter 1, number verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So these lay people fasted and prayed, laid their hands on the ministers and sent them out to do another work in another city. They had a great part in this. Acts 15, verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. So they receive a letter from a disciple, they read to the church, and Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So here are people other than the disciples again, preaching and confirming the word to individual Christians. Acts 17. Paul and Silas were preaching, and then in verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Now this is after the word is really spread in the city, and then finally the opposition comes from the Antichrist. You see, they ignored the opposition from their friends and relatives. Now they do get opposition from the Antichrist. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Now you read that passage over again, and I think you'll find that it's very possible that's what we're headed for. If we do our work diligently, we are going to be accused of placing Jesus before the state. And that's what they were accused of. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Jason apparently had to put up a bond of some sort, some sort of security in order to be released from the prison. How many of the people who are listening to this tape or who are here have done enough Christian work in their city to get arrested at the instigation of the Antichrist and have to put up a bond to stay out of prison. These men did such diligent Christian work and witness, they actually forced the Antichrist to rouse themselves up and attempt to stop them. We haven't even touched that idea in the Israel Identity Movement to any extent at all. Acts 18, verse 7. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. What did he do? He went in a layman's home at his invitation and preached to a group of people in a house. 
And then he goes on in verse 11, it says, And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul was invited to a layman's home, stayed there for a year and a half, and preached. But the layman provided the house and the place to preach. The gospel of Jesus Christ was spread throughout the Mediterranean in less than a century, and it was not done by Paul and 11 or 12 other disciples. It was done by scores and hundreds and thousands of lay people doing the things that God had told them to do regarding witnessing. 1 Corinthians 16. The lay leaders here are placed on an equal footing with the apostles or ministers. Verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first, root, first fruits of Achaia, and that they have it and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such and to every one that helpeth with us and laboreth. So Paul writes to the Christian people, and he says, These other lay people, these elders, these men, have taken upon themselves to do those things they should do, and you submit yourselves unto them. Now I'm telling you that you do not submit yourself specifically under Pastor Emery. In any community or any city or any locality where laymen will take hold and begin to teach and to preach and set up meetings, you submit yourself to them. You go to those meetings. You cooperate with them. And the Word of God will spread like it did back here in the first century. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 22. And we have sent with them our brother, whom ye have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. These other Christian lay people who were helping Paul, working with Paul, working in their own areas, Paul said, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. You gather around and help and work with and pray for any Christian who will take it upon himself to do the work of the ministry and preach. He doesn't have to be a church-ordained ministry or a full-time. And I guess what I'm saying in the final analysis, the conclusion is given here in one verse in Romans 12, and I pray to God that every layman and laywoman who hears this will take this to heart because God has promised a great revival and a turning and a teaching in Israel. It cannot be done by a half a dozen men or a dozen. It's not going to be done by a few because then they would receive glory, would they not? The work is going to be done by hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands. And that means eventually you listen and you obey what Paul writes here in chapter 12 of Romans. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. You do not have to die for Christ or your brethren. You live for them. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He's not calling on you for something out of the ordinary, something more than Christians should do. Present your body a living, working, preaching, praying, believing sacrifice in Israel, which is your reasonable service. Depend upon Jesus and do the work that God lays out before you. Do it diligently and we'll see a revival in Israel like we have never seen in Israel in past ages. I believe that. Our Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will imbue all hearts and minds here and those who hear these words with the necessity for each Christian to do the work that thou hast given him to witness, especially in their own family, among their children and their grandchildren. You have commanded us to teach our children and our children's children. Father, we pray.